types of black people to be true. So what does that mean, right? It means like, yeah, I don't like a lot of them, but that one's okay, right? That's racism 2.0, but it, you know, it's some updated software, but it's running on the old mainframe, you know? It's some of the same old, you just sort of repurposed it, you know, repackaged it. But if I believe that the larger group is dysfunctional, the fact that I carve out an exception for one guy, right, or a handful of people doesn't change that it's still racist. So this isn't about like, oh, this person is awful and this person is great and these people are awful and these people are great. We're all a mix of awful and great. It's the reality, right? We've all been conditioned to be racist and to be sexist and to be classist and all of this stuff, right? We, we've been hit with that stuff ever since we were kids. So none of us are completely free from that. That's that the idea that we can divide ourselves into like the racist and the unracist is just nonsense, right? It's not about that. It's like, if we ask if Donald Trump is a racist, it's sort of like asking if a drug dealer is also an addict. I don't know, and I don't care, right? It's like with Donald Trump, it's like, I don't know if he gets high on his own supply, but I know what he's selling, right? So at some point, whether or not he's a racist, if he's actually manipulating on the basis of race, if he's using race and racial resentment and racial anxiety in order to get elected, the action is racist. It's not about somebody's core character. And this is something that the right has been manipulating for a very long time. Go back to 1981, there's a audio recording. You can Google this and listen to it yourself. 1981, Lee Atwater, who was for a long time, probably before Karl Rove, the most prominent conservative Republican consultant of the modern era. He had worked for Reagan, he worked for George H.W. Bush, he worked for all the sort of leading conservative Republican candidates through the 80s and into the 90s. He has since died of cancer, and, um, but before all of that, before he got sick, when he was still very much embedded in Republican conservative politics, 1981, there's an audio tape of him where he actually admits this as a strategy, right? He actually is on the tape saying, listen, you know, back in the 1950s, you could say, and he, you know, it's the N word, I'm not gonna say it. He says it in the tape like three times. You know, he says it over and over and over again. And then he says, but by the 60s, you know, late 60s, you can't say that word anymore. It gets you in trouble. So you start using other words like states' rights and crime and welfare, right? And taxes. Right? And he says, and now you're getting so abstract, it sounds like it's all just about economics, but the real purpose and the point here is that black people get hurt worse than white people. And all of those bricks, hundreds of them, represent the human beings owned by the man who wrote those words, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So you see, truth and justice doesn't come from the great man because that man whom we consider quite great in our American history owned hundreds of other human beings, violated his own principles. The only reason we're here today is because black folks believed his words more than he believed his words, know that. And then you move on and you see some other things. There's an auction block from which human beings were sold by great men quote unquote, an auction block on which we're told Andrew Jackson once stood to give a speech. Nat Turner's Bible is there. There's an ax handle that used to belong to Lester Maddox, segregationist governor of Georgia. He used to, before he was governor, run folks out of his restaurant with an ax handle who were black. And you're reminded as you walk through this place, Emmett Till's casket is there. You're reminded of something very important for us right now and never forget it. And what is that lesson? That lesson is that folks of color have been overcoming bigger and badder than Donald John Trump for a long time. And if you think, <laughs> if you think for even one minute, that this thing is done, 
If you think for even one minute that folks of color are going to fold when they didn't fold for Bull Connor, when they didn't fold for Jim Clark on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, when they didn't fold when Martin and Malcolm and Medgar were murdered, when they didn't fold when Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten in the jail in Ruleville, I promise you, you have not studied this country's history and you do not know black and brown people. So this thing right here... This thing right here is just beginning. This is not the end of anything, it's the start. So welcome to the resistance and here we go. So what does this mean in real terms? See, here's the thing, this is what concerns me. Having said everything that I just said, I also importantly want to point out that this is not about Donald Trump. Just a recent manifestation of some really old. You know, if you saw the SNL skit like the week after the election, right? Chappelle and Chris Rock on the show, right? These white folks up in their crib in Brooklyn were all freaking out. They're like, how could this happen? My God, how, did, how are people this racist? And see, the two black folks were like, really? Y'all are shocked by this? Like, <laughs> this was like, we just call this Monday, you know, this is. People of color weren't really shocked. That's not to say that people of color aren't upset now. There's a difference between being surprised that it happened and shocked. Maybe folks didn't think it was gonna happen, but that doesn't mean that you were like, oh my God, how is this possible, right? You know, like, things happen, right? And so we gotta understand that even though some of this stuff is new in the sense of maybe the level of extremity or the level of danger that we're looking at right now because of some historic circumstances, some of this stuff is really old. Like the struggle right now isn't really that different than the struggle six months ago. It's not really that different than the struggle a year ago or three years ago or five years ago. The struggle for police accountability, it's not any different. It may be harder, right, with an administration that is not going to investigate police unaccountability the same way, that's not going to attempt to hold police accountable for the things that they do nearly as much even as the last one. The last one didn't do enough either. But these folks probably not going to do it. So that's a problem, but the struggle is the same. You understand, even if the ability to find allies in high places is less, that doesn't change the struggle itself. We still make the same arguments. We still mobilize in the same way. And so if unarmed black folks are three times more likely than unarmed white folks to be shot, and that is a fact nationwide, then the struggle is the struggle, whether Donald Trump is president or not. Right. If racial profiling is such that people of color are three to four times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs, even though white folks are twice as likely to have drugs on us on the occasion when we're searched, and that's a fact, the struggle is the same, whether Donald Trump is the president or not. So, some of this isn't really new, and I want us to understand that because I don't want us to get knocked off stride by the idea that the struggles are now the result of this administration. This stuff has been going on for a very long time. Most importantly, and here's the really key thing, right? So recently I did a video that was uh, featuring Tim Wise. Tim Wise is uh, an American uh, Hebrew or Jewish um, activist who is always uh, defending uh, the rights of the black people in the United States of America. Yes, it's a paradox that a white person defending black people in America. It's a paradox, but it's true. I love paradoxes because we find a lot of learning and experiences with the paradoxes. However, in today's video, the last video, uh, Tim Wise was able to explain the origin and how and the mechanics, the origin and the mechanics of racism. Today, uh, Tim Wise was able to explain, or is going to explain, uh, how uh, racism is affecting black culture today, the contemporary effects of racism uh, in modern, in today's African culture, the African and the African diaspora. The African diaspora now will include the black Americans, uh, the black Britons, the black people living in uh, Asia. I'm told we have so many black people in Asia, Thailand and Southeast Asia, uh, black people in uh, South America, and black people all in other parts of the world. Uh, 
this uh, this revelation that uh, Tim Weiss is going to give is something that is going to be of much importance to realizing and uh, acknowledging. Indeed, it's high time we realize we are living in the 21st century. We are not living in those uh, slavery era or those colonial era. Right now we have the energy, we have the rights, we have the responsibility of standing up against racism and speaking against racism. Racism does not have to be black, white to black. It can also be black to white, but the most common one is the white to black. And this is the one which Tim Wise is going to speak about. So without further ado, let's jump into this video, listen to what Tim Wise is going to share, and then I'll give you my thoughts and, of course, my critical analysis uh, by the end of the video. So let's dive in right now. The very election of this man, based on the rhetoric and the narrative that he spun, is America 101. Because if I had to explain to you in one phrase the history of this country with regard to race and with regard to class, this would be the phrase. The whole history of America is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their problems are caused by brown and black people. That is the whole history of America. All the rest, as they say, is commentary. Right? It's all footnote from there. Right? The whole history of America is rich white men, or at least men who say they're rich. Now, we don't really know, do we? <laughs> we don't really know. He inherited, not even inherited, took over a $237 million real estate empire from his daddy, but likes you to believe he is a self-made man. All right. Give me $237 million worth of assets and I will probably become rich too. Doesn't take a lot of skill, would take a hell of a lot of skill to lose all that dough. So I'm not sure we need to applaud the man for that, but whatever, he says he's rich and for the sake of my argument, I'm just gonna give it to him because it helps my history lesson. So we'll stick with it. Rich white men telling not rich white people that their problems are brown people, that goes back 400 years, all right? Go back to the 1600s. What do we see in the colonies of what would become the United States? We see Rich white people who were very, not even called, first of all, they're not called white yet. Because we hadn't created that yet, right? We hadn't thought of that. See, that was some other stuff. We came up with that. We hadn't thought of that yet. We were just, there were some rich European people who owned all the land. And among them were what? African enslaved folks and European peasants, many of them indentured servants, right? Just one level above enslavement themselves. And they outnumbered the rich dramatically. In some places, five to one, 10 to one, other places, two to one, but always outnumbered the rich. The rich were always a very small percentage. Just like right now, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans owns the same amount of stuff as the bottom 90%. Wealth inequality is not really new. It's been the legacy of America. It might be more extreme right now than it's been in the contemporary period, but at the outset of the colonies, that was normative. So you had this handful of rich folks from Europe facing poor Europeans and African enslaved folks and indigenous peoples whose land they were seeking to conquer and they began to realize something. They were like, holy hell, like this is not gonna work forever. <laughs> like at some point, <laughs> these folks are gonna figure out that this is sort of shit for them. Like they're gonna wanna take our stuff, right? Because they're gonna realize we're hurting all of them, not just enslaved African folk and indigenous folk, but even these poor European folks. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? We got to come up with something, man. We got to have some kind of a, a game that we can run on them. What's the game? Oh, we got a game. We came up with a game. The game was called the white race, right? This game was called, let's create this new fictional thing. We're going to call all these European people white people. Now, you know, that's like not real, right? You think that Europeans thought of themselves as one big happy family? This is what's so funny about these white nationalists that are coming out of the woodwork in the wake of the Trump campaign. They act like whiteness has some historical pedigree. The hell, you think Europeans loved each other? Man, we spent most of our time trying to kill each other. The English hated the Irish, the Irish hated the English. Northern Italians didn't even think that Southern Italians were Italians. Germans hated everybody. And the world felt the same way about them. 
Europeans spent most of our time trying to kill each other or in the colonies of what became the United States, trying to figure out who the witch was. That's the history of Europeans. <laughs> you're a witch, well, you're a warlock. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna burn you at the stake for not worshiping our Lord the right way. That's sort of what we did, right? So the idea that we were one big team called white people is absurd. Whiteness became a concept created for one reason only, and that was to sucker poor, working class, immiserated, peasant Europeans into believing that they actually were on the same team as rich people. So if you tell them, oh, well, you know, you're white now. Oh, yeah, I know. Wow. We've been kicking your ass forever, but... Uh, now we're going to put you on the slave patrol. Oh, yeah. We're going to give you a horse and a badge and a gun and let you keep those black people in line for us, right? And these working class white folks on the slave patrol, the ancient precursor, if you will, to modern policing, right? Working class folks. See, because the police ain't rich and neither were the folks on the slave patrol. It was who rich people hired to protect their from everybody else. So you get these poor white folks, put them on a horse to control enslaved people to do what? To ask for their papers when you see them out. Let me see your papers. Let me see your identification. Who do you belong to? Ultimate stop and frisk, 16 and 1700 style. Racial profiling, 16 and 1700 style, right? Prove that you belong in this community. Show me that you're legitimately in this community. Prop 187, 1600 and 1700 style. Anti-immigration, 1600 and 1700 style. And it was poor and working class white folks that got pulled into that because what it made them feel like they're part of the team. Oh, I'm on the team now, I'm white now. For real, because these other white folks, they don't love you. They would starve you, they did back in the old country, but now they gave you a taste of power. They gave you what W.E.B. Du Bois called what? The psychological wage of whiteness, right? And that's won't pay your bills, but it'll make you feel better. It puffs you up, right? It's like, I may not have much, but at least I'm not black. I may not have much, but at least I'm not indigenous. I may not have much, but at least I'm not Mexican when we jack half of their country in a war of aggression that we started. I know that's not, I know, I know, I know that's not what they taught you in eighth grade, but that's how that actually went down. You may not have much, but at least you're not Chinese brought to work on the railroads and build them from dusk to dawn and dawn to dusk to build the transcontinental economy of this country. So you may not have much, but at least you're better than them, see? And so you create that mentality. You divide and conquer working class coalitions. You give European people just a little bit of taste of power and say, those are your enemy. And then that works for generations. And then we come up to the Civil War era, right? And it's still working, right? My folks from the South, I'm from the South, lived in the South all my life. And the only difference between those of us from the South and the rest of y'all is we know that our <laughs> stinks, see? <laughs> For real, like, those of us in the South who are white, we know we have an issue. <laughs> white folks in California, not always clear on that, so y'all need to get clear. So the Confederacy decides what? These elite, rich, white landowners in the South decide they got to break away from the Union. And they made clear why they did it now. 150 years later, we lie about it. My people lie about it. We act like it wasn't about slavery. Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> wasn't, about, wasn't about that. It was about states' rights. <laughs> well, what right do you think they were fighting for, Buttercup? Do you think they were fighting for the right to determine the proper recipe for a mint julep? <laughs> the proper way to s smoke a pork butt? No, they were fighting for one right only, the right to own other human beings and to extend ownership into those newly conquered territories to the West as a result of that illegal war with Mexico, et cetera. So 
had nothing to do with states' rights in the abstract. The Confederate leaders said so at the time. They said, Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy, the cornerstone of this new government is the idea, the great truth, that the Negro is not the equal of the white man. That's what he said. He didn't talk about trade policy. He didn't talk about tariffs. He didn't try to lard it up with a bunch of bull. He just said straight up it was white supremacy because they weren't ashamed at the time. Now we've reinvented history, act like that's not it. But at the time they were clear. Now here's the trick though, here's the trick. This is where it gets crazy because when you got a bunch of rich folks that are saying we need to go to war to protect our property interest in human beings, but now we're not gonna fight. Because <laughs> rich people don't go to war. Rich people not gonna fight, whether it's in 1861 or in 1969. Rich folks don't go to war. Rich folks get doctors to write bullshit notes saying they have heel spurs so they don't have to go to war. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, Google that shit when we're done. Rich people don't ever fight to protect their stuff. Rich people don't believe in fighting, they believe in getting poor people to fight for them. Every time, every year, every generation, it's poor folks that get sent off to fight and die for rich folks' stuff. And so the rich in the South sent poor people, but how do you do that? How do you convince poor white people to go fight to protect your property interests in slaves? That's a tough trick, right? Because why would you do that, right? Like, why would you go fight for a rich person's property? Like, I, I'm not rich, but I, you know, I got a nice house. And for those of you who were students, just because like you're students, I probably got more than you. So even though I'm not rich, <laughs> right? I'm just saying like, probably, you know, because I've been a little older, I've been around a minute. So if I were to call y'all up on the phone next week because there was like an enemy army invading my block or some <laughs> and I was like, hey, y'all, look, there's an army. They're coming, yeah, they got tanks and they're about to take my stuff, but I don't feel like fighting because... I just want to sit out on the back porch and have a drink. Why don't y'all come and protect my stuff for me? You'd be like, yeah, I like the speech and all, Tim, but no. Like, that would be it. Like, you wouldn't do it. But these poor Southerners and working class Southerners without a pot to piss in in the South, they went and fought and hundreds of thousands of them died to protect the property of the rich. Why? Because the rich said, hey, if these folks get free, they're going to take your job. No, fool. They already have your job. You get that, right? Because if you're white and you got to charge a dollar a day to work on that farm, but the owner can get the black guy or the black woman to do it for free because they own them, guess who gets the gig? The free labor, right? Because people like free, right? Given a choice between free, don't cost me anything, and a dollar a day, guess what? The white guy didn't get the job. So in effect, white poor folks would have been better off to help overthrow the system of enslavement and white supremacy and work for a better economic deal. But rich, rich white people held out that psychological wage of whiteness that said you may not have much, but at least you're above them. And then folks settle for that. Fast forward to the labor union movement. Same thing was happening. You had rich corporate owners that actually collaborated with some union leaders in many cases to keep unions segregated. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Why would a labor leader fall for that? Right, because you gotta think about it, but they did because they would say, oh, well, we can't have, we can't have black people and Mexicans and Chinese labor in our unions. It'll reduce the professionalism of the working class. No fool, it'll double the size of your union, right? Which is sort of a good thing. Like when you go out on strike, it'd be good if you had more people, not fewer. <laughs> Just like a math problem, you know. <laughs> and also because if you don't bring people of color into your union, what's the boss gonna do? The very boss that encouraged you to fight amongst yourselves, that boss is gonna hire the very same black and brown folks that you didn't want in your union to replace your happy white ass. And then you're gonna get mad at who? The boss? No, you're gonna get mad at the black and brown labor who quote unquote took your job. See, some doesn't change. Rich white folks telling not rich white people that their jobs got taken by people of color. Fast forward to the present. We got somebody swearing that if we can just build that wall, just build that wall, just, but just that one wall on the southern border because we don't trip about this one. We, we just trip about this one, not that one. We don't, we're not worried 
I guess we're not worried about crafty Canadians <laughs> trying to figure out how to sneak into this country to take advantage of our superior health care. We're just worried about these folks, but it's not about race. Remember, it's not about race. It's just about legal and illegal, even though 40% of the people in this country who were quote unquote undocumented didn't even cross the border. They're not undocumented at the time they cross any border. They came on legal visas, be they work visas or educational visas, overstayed those visas. A disproportionate number of those are not in fact from south of that border. They are overwhelmingly disproportionately from places like Canada, like Europe, not from Mexico, Central and South America, but we scapegoat some and not the others because again, it's about rich white folks or presumptively rich white folks telling not rich white people that their problems are brown. It has nothing to do with facts. And by the way, the idea that if you build a wall, jobs are coming back for real, do y'all, does anybody understand economics at all? Do you actually think that like, the nation's capitalists are sitting around just waiting. They're like, holy shit, I hope they don't figure out that they could just build a wall. <laughs> Do you actually think the capitalists are like, we've got them. We've been screwing them for years. We haven't been paying them right. We've been, you know, like not giving them benefits. But if they build that wall, we're going to have to give them all a raise. Really? Do you think that's how it works? You build a wall and then all of a sudden the jobs come back. No, the wall doesn't stop capital from moving. Neither does a tweet, by the way. An angry tweet doesn't actually cause a company to change its plans. If you think that an angry tweet makes a multinational corporation decide, oh, holy hell, well, the, you know, he's mad at me on Twitter, so I guess we'll just keep the jobs here. You know nothing about economics at all, right? A tweet's not gonna change, neither is a wall gonna change capital mobilization. Capital's always gonna be free to cross borders. Goods are always going to be free to cross borders in search of the highest price, capital in search of the highest return. The only thing a wall does is chain labor to its country of origin. And if you have a policy that chains labor to its country of origin but allows capital to move wherever the hell it wants, so I can still move my company south of the border, I can still move to Sri Lanka to take advantage of less labor protection, environmental protection, etc. All you've done is tilt the game against labor permanently, and not just labor south of the border, but labor north of the border as well. Labor in this country would be far better off to have more folks here who were fighting for justice, who were fighting for better wages, who were fighting for better benefits, not something like a wall or a deportation policy that would limit the ability of those folks to mobilize for radical change. That is not a pro-worker policy, but it is very much in keeping with the mentality that says to those non-rich white folks, your problems are those people. And as long as we can keep folks thinking that, we're not dealing with the real problems. As long as we can keep people focused on that. See, that's the divide and conquer mentality that has existed for generations. There is nothing new about it. And we've been falling for it for hundreds of years to our own detriment. So we have to be prepared to actually deal with that. What does that mean? What does it mean to not know that history? See, it's not just a history lesson, right? It also helps to explain what's going on right now. History, sometimes we don't get why it's relevant. You know, we sit in classes learning history and we think like, why do I need to know this stuff? And I understand because a lot of times it's taught in a very sterile kind of way and sort of boring way. And it's like, why do I need to know this, right? Why is this important? Why can't we just ignore this. Well, a lot of reasons why you can't, just as one little point, because you know, white folks, we love to do this, right? White, white folks, particularly around race, we like to say things like, why can't black people just get over it? Like, <laughs> slavery was a long time ago, and, all right? Why can't they just move on? Well, uh, this is sort of precious coming from people who set off fireworks every July 4th, because that's some old <laughs> too, right? Like Independence Day, that didn't happen last week, right? We didn't break away from the British last Thursday. That's some old shit. But we're still celebrating that. So when it's stuff that makes us feel good, we love it. When it's stuff that makes us feel better than others, superior, like we're the greatest people and the greatest country ever struck off from the forehead of God Almighty, oh, we'll remember that forever. We just don't like the stuff that brings us up a little short, makes us look a little less than superior, maybe not quite as good as we'd like to believe. If you don't understand why the past affects the present, particularly around issues like enslavement, putting aside the inheritance of wealth and the lack thereof, 
part of which is certainly an explanation for why currently the median white wealth is 15 times the median African American wealth and 11 to 12 times the median Latino wealth. Certainly that has something to do with history, who had access to resources and who didn't. But putting aside that, let's just understand something. The only reason Donald Trump is president right now is because of a little thing called the Electoral College which was put in place by folks. See, we got this revisionist history that we've been spinning for the last couple of months about the Electoral College. Oh, you know, it was put in there to prevent tyranny. For real, you think? Do you really think that? Because I don't think that. Right? That might have been one of the things that folks were concerned about, but it was also put in because folks like the folks in Virginia, in the bigger slaveholding states, didn't want direct democracy or anything even remotely like it because it would have hurt them because so much of their population was not enfranchised, right? So much of their population in some areas, 40% or over half of the people in some of those slaveholding states were what? Disenfranchised, counted as three-fifths of a human being, not considered people. And if you had anything remotely resembling direct democracy, those states would have been harmed by that. So in fact, the Electoral College was in part a compromise with slaveholding states, states who were dependent upon enslavement as a mechanism of economic development so as to improve their political position vis-a-vis -vis non slaveholding states. So if you don't understand how slavery, because this is the point, right? Even if you don't think racism was key to Donald Trump's own campaign, which you know, suggests to me that you might have been asleep for the last several months, even if you believe that, understand that racism in the 1700s White supremacy embedded in the structure of the country at the founding of the country is most definitely implicated in his election because without the obeisance to the electoral college, without that compromise, we know he would not be president right now. So that is why we have to think about the past and that is why the past affects the present. See, inertia is not just a property of the physical universe. It is also a property of the socioeconomic and the political universe that we have to address. And it's important for us to address that as a systemic matter. See, this is the other problem. We talk about race and racism, right? That I think we gotta move through if we're gonna be effective. Because ever since the election, it's been very, you know, it's easy, I suppose, for people to, and they ask me this a lot, and you've probably, you know, sort of come up upon these kind of conversations where people are, you know, do you think Donald Trump's a racist? Donald Trump a racist? Are all of his supporters racist? All of these are the wrong questions, right? It isn't really about whether he's a racist or whether his supporters are racist or not. I, I would never, first of all, assume that all of anybody's supporters are anything, right? I mean, that would just be ignorant. I would never say like, oh, the only reason you would ever vote for Donald Trump is because you're a bigot. Look, not only are not all of Donald Trump's supporters racist, not all of Hillary Clinton's aren't racist. Let's be clear about that. And in fact, in 2008, look, in 2008, I remember there were polls that came out like a month before the election, right, where something like 28% of white Democrats who said, and I assume they were telling the truth, that they were going to vote for Barack Obama in a month or six weeks or whatever it was, 28% of white Democrats six weeks out from the election said, yeah, I'm gonna vote for that guy, but they acknowledged to pollsters that they still believed at least one, if not several racist stereotypes. So um, during the early days when HIV was now being new, it was a strange disease. It was just like Corona, how Corona started. Uh, my condolences to the families who lost uh, their people uh, in that, um, that disease. Uh, my condolences. So what happens is that people still didn't know what AIDS was. People didn't know what Corona was. It was until the first individual had the disease. And these individuals, we call them patient zero. A patient zero is an individual who has the first case of a disease. According to studies, according to history that I have done, I have discovered that the first patient zero was not from Africa. It was a white person and he flew from USA and moved to Africa and he was the first patient zero. The same way with Ebola. This, every disease has a patient zero. But how do they come to the realization uh, patient zero is hosting a certain kind of parasite? 
or a certain kind of bacteria or virus or a pathogen how do they come to it they come to that realization after doing examinations in the laboratories diseases parasites pathogens bacteria all these things are not good for the human health all these things are things which are cultivated to take away the human life the african and the whole entire human race you know and so after we have discovered this disease what we do next or what the scientists do next is they provide vaccination and if the disease cannot have vaccination like hiv aids cannot have vaccination they provide curative form- formulas curative formulas are formulas you can use to cure it if it's not curable they provide preventative cautions preventative methods and if it does not every disease can be pre- prevented it cannot be cured but it can be prevented the whole of this i'm speaking on the context of racism in the usa racism is a pathogen racism is a disease racism is a bacteria racism is so bad i myself personally i have experienced racism i myself personally i have been accused of racism yes i was accused of racism by a fellow african I was they said I was racist to them sometimes we don't know what racism is and anything that we find uncomfortable with us we might call it racism some of these diseases were being confused for other diseases they thought aids was tuberculosis but aids was far much worse aids showed some symptoms that tuberculosis had or rather aids had symptoms that tuberculosis had but it was far more far much more worse these are things that are affecting humans you know um when i come back and try and look at the things such as uh the situations of black americans in usa and i see how they live i'm trying to ask myself how did it start who was the patient zero Or what was the first parasite who is the first person that carried the idea we are superior to these people who is the first person that gave birth to that disease of racism who is this parasite who is this bacteria who is it is it the white person is it the black person is it the chinese is it the indian who is it it is a human it's a human racism can take both formats racism and the reverse racism it happens in south africa we've seen it happen africans can be racist to white people as well it's something that we find uncomfortable to speak about but it's true it's called reverse apartheid reverse um racism but who started it all or does it really matter who started it I don't think it matters who started it. We've already been there. We are already here. It's high time we just sit back and find a solution. What can we do about this? How can we end this? We can find a cure. We can find vaccines. Uh we can develop preventative cautions. Things to do to avoid getting intact with these diseases. You know? People like Tim Wise are people who are really helping in discovering and knowing the origins of such things because before you develop a vaccine before you develop a cure you have to know the nature of the disease you have to know how it works on its environment it's like hiv aids hiv aids takes an advantage of a gene in the human body you know you know it's called retroviral retroviral it works in a not in an obvious way you see it's a retroviral it's a group of diseases they don't work in the normal way 
So for years, scientists have tried to come up with a solution to overcome these retroviral diseases. You know, team-wise, it's like these scientists. They are coming, discussing this is how it operates, and this is what we should do. At least when we know the history of something, it's easier to deal with it. Santa Zuz says, if you know your enemy, you've already won part of the war. Compare that, you know, you don't know your enemy. You need to know something about their enemy. Does not matter how much you know, but just know something. Something is better than nothing. You get me? And so, seeing black Americans suffer all this, one of the solutions can be moving to Africa. You can move to Africa uh, to avoid all that, but mostly uh, running away from a problem does not solve it because not all African Americans can run away from U.S. Some are so much attached, but it's still acceptable. You can always leave it and move here. It's just like the disease. You can decide, ah, I don't want to do anything that will give me the disease and find a cure. Let me prevent it. And that's how you do You prevent it. You know? I'm grateful that characters such as Tim Wise have come up and they've decided that we want to tell the black people the truth. We want to tell them how it came to be. We want to tell them that we are not superior than them. We want to tell the black people we are all equal. And perhaps... Things we do today, the technology we are using, we borrowed from them. The thing we only did is we refined it. I was shocked the other day. I was really shocked. I always thought the automatic transmission was invented by a white person or some kind of German, you know, Germans with their technology. I was shocked to find that the person who invented the, automotive trans the automatic transmission in uh, vehicles was a black person. A black person invented the automatic transmissions, something that has really made it easy for almost anybody can drive a car today because of a black person. But you'd never hear it anywhere. You never hear it. You never hear it. Hmm? There's a lot that black people have done and they're not being given credit. I personally think, and I always say, give credit where credit is due. You get me? When we understand that we and our role in this face of the earth does not have to be USA, does not have to be Africa. Understand your role in this part of the in, in this part of the world where you are located. I'm located in Kenya right now. I'm trying to understand my role. You know? No matter what someone might come and tell me, hey, you are a black person. You don't deserve to speak some, some of these things or some of those things. You don't deserve to go to certain restaurants. You don't deserve to do this and this. I understand I am in my country. I can, I can go anywhere I please. I can go anywhere I please. Or if I can't go, I know a black person can go there. You get me? Uh, there's so much. There's so much that Tim Weiss has uh, revealed about uh, black history uh, black races. Mine, mine is just to add. Mine is just a value addition. Much has been said by Tim Wise, and I hope we are, you've, you've been able to gather important information and uh, realize how this thing operates. If you can't prevent it, cure it. If you can't cure it, find a vaccine. Find a vaccine. But for racism, for racism, we don't have vaccines. For racism, we don't have cure. For racism, we can only have a prevention. The prevention starts with you. The prevention starts with me. Yes. So that's our EFK original documentaries. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, give me a super thanks. Uh, join my Patreon. Uh, become a member of the channel. I'll so much, so much appreciate and remember to stay black. Remember to stay black. Just, just love yourself. Love your blackness. Love, just love your blackness. Okay? Love your blackness. Yeah.